So the second part of the survey of the seminar is a panel of projects that are ongoing in South Dakota. They've been going, as we talked this morning, for almost two years. The three panelists have a great program to assist older communities, people in our communities, and they can all be potentially replicated in your communities. In your packet, there are a sheet on each of these individual programs that gives you additional information and contact information, one for each one of those programs. In addition, I'll let you know that we are recording this afternoon session and it will be hopefully available on our website so you can share it with people in your community, give them the same information that you're getting today and they would be able to watch the, this presentation. So we will move into our first presenter. Lisey Brown works for the SDSU Extension. She's a gerontology field specialist. I had no idea SDSU had a gerontology field specialist. She's the only one in the state and she's based out of Rapid City. She's an advocate for broader discussions about aging and older people. She's convinced many of the challenges we face as we age could be addressed through innovations in home, technology, and community design. Lisi is a go-to source for aging and there is a wealth of resources on the iGrow website and Lisi posts blogs on the topic on a regular basis. We have a few samples of that in, at the information table at the back of the room. Lisi? So thank you so much. We're not on yet, so she'll get the slides going for us. Fantastic. So we're calling this session Creating Intergener Opportunity, Intergenerational Opportunities in Rural Communities. Um, I don't know if you have noticed, but our communities are just a smidge age segregated. We have our young people here. We have our older people there. And there's tremendous benefit in bringing together the generation. So what is it? Intergenerational programming is intentionally bringing people from different generations together and making it purposeful and having some sort of goals in mind when you do this. Um, who benefits? At its core, age, intergenerational programs are age friendly. When we connect younger people and older people we build ties to the community. We encourage younger people to stay in their communities by building those relationships with older people. Um, why? So technology, why use technology to bring younger people and older people together? Technology is a great tool. It's an amazing tool. I mean, most of us have cell phones, computers, and it gives us access to goods, services, social connections, and a lot of stuff. When we can't use technology, it's a barrier. It, we aren't able to access and interact with our community fully. So using technology to create intergener intergenerational opportunities is what I did. And the name of the program is Teach SD. And so it's an innovative program. And it's not new to recruit young people to teach older people to use technology. That's not novel. That's been going on for, what, since the 90s? What makes my approach unique is the fact that I teach the volunteers how to teach adults to use technology. It's a really um, nuanced skill. Think about a page, like a page in a book. When you're working with a new technology user, that nuanced language may be difficult. In addition, as we get older, we develop physical limitations that may make it more difficult to use technology. Unless our volunteers understand that those limitations may exist, there's a barrier to learning. So if we teach our volunteers how to remove those barriers to learning, it enhances the learning for the adults. So that's a lot of what I'm doing here. The young people, I rely on their expertise to be able to teach the technology. I don't teach them specific pieces of technology. I teach them how to teach. We have two goals with this program. We're trying to help adults learn to use technology, but we're also trying to reduce ages stereotypes. Oftentimes, we take younger people to nursing homes when we want to connect them to older people. The challenge with that is we're only showing them 4% of the population of adults over the age of 65. These are adults who are experiencing chronic health conditions, they may be near the end of their life. And if we take younger people and put them in that environment and say, this is what it's like to age, 
And then we wonder why we can't get young people to enter professions that serve older people. So it's really to diversify the exposure of young people. So we're helping adults to learn to use technology, and we're making sure that younger people are exposed to older people in positive ways. So what, what have we done? We developed a program. Sorry, it feels like I'm missing a slide. There it is, sorry guys. So what have we done? We've developed the program, we've developed the curriculum that we use to teach the young people about aging, about older adults. Um, we teach them learning styles and then we give them strategies to teach new technology users. And we have been evaluating the program. We, the program began in 2014 and then we had the pleasure of being approached by the Community Foundation and Grant Makers in Aging to re receive additional support so we could really dig in deep and understand, is our model good? Because at, at the end of the day, if it's not a good model and we can't replicate it, we need to look elsewhere. So we got to hire an evaluator and we were having some challenges. We weren't quite reaching our goals. So we had to do a little bit of work to understand. I'll get to that on the next page. Um, so we've been doing this process evaluation to figure out what works. How, what are the best steps that we can take for communities to create intergenerational programs? So we've been doing a lot of process evaluation on that piece. I wanna talk about some of the challenges that we experienced, because I think that's really important to understand um, what's going on. We spent a lot of time evaluating our process because we realized we weren't achieving our goals. I, my goal was to have 12 lessons happening every month at every site. Wasn't happening. So we had to really take a step back. So in the summer of 2016, we paused lessons and we really explored what's working, what's not working. Um, we spent a lot of time discussing what factors are leading to success. Uh, and then we explored the gaps between what we where we wanted to be and where we were. In September of 16, um, we resumed activities and I am excited to report that 135 lessons have happened in South Dakota since that time. So it's pretty exciting. We're not quite where we wanna be, but we've learned tremendous amount about what it takes to make intergenerational technology programs work. And the number one thing that adults are asking about. Anybody wanna take a guess about what are adults asking for help with? Because that's another thing I didn't tell you. The adult gets to bring their device for help. What are they asking about? Phones. Cell phones, number one thing that the adults are asking for are help with their cell phones. And I'll tell you this little um, side story because I tell you a lot of what I do is teaching how to remove those barriers because there's a lot of barriers. That's that whole design piece. I would talk to you all day long about why design disables us. So we have this older woman, she's in her early 90s. Uh, she wants to learn to use her smart, smartphone. Daughter gave her an iPhone, absolutely loves it. Wants to take the events from the senior newspaper and put them in her iPhone so she has it. So as I've been working with this woman, oh, since October she's been receiving lessons, I've noticed that she struggles with the touch screen. Part of it is um, her nails are really long, but part of it is her dexterity isn't quite as good. So I gave her a stylist. The change in her proficiency was astounding. All of a sudden she's entering dates into her iPhone with me barely just watching her. I'm just kind of like, all right, Reggie, have a ball. So learning to remove those barriers is a lot of what I'm doing. So the lessons that we've learned since we've been doing this project, when we initially started, we gave the sites a lot of flexibility and the lessons were very sporadic. And we've kind of come down to, with it, come to the understanding that there has to be a regular schedule. Whether it's twice a month, it's weekly, there has to be a regular schedule that it's easy for the volunteers to predict and the adult participants. Um, our partner sites, it works better when there is already similar programming happening. Because really what I bring in is that training for the volunteers. I enhance the, the skills of the volunteers to teach adults to use technology. Um, so it's gotta be that bottom up organic, like the community has to decide that they want this. I mean, initially I was trying to recruit sites left and right. My most successful sites have been the ones who have come to me and said, we want this and they just, they're amazing how much they blossom and bloom all on their own. 
uh, expectations. It's got to be really clear. And outside on the table, there is a stack, a document, like a, a Bible fold type document that's got some, describes the expectations. But making sure everybody involved understands the expectations. Um, the adult partner is almost the most important person involved in the whole project because they're, they're going to be the advocate. They're going to help recruit the adults. They're going to help recruit the children. They're almost the most important partner is that whoever is going to kind of oversee the program at, in the community. We know, learned that we had to clarify the orientation and what I was actually doing because I had a few people say to me, the kids know how to use technology. Why are you teaching them to use technology? And it's like, no, no, no. I'm not teaching kids how to use technology. I'm not te teaching that. I'm teaching them how to teach technology. That's a very subtle but important difference. Um, and I also learned that volunteer resource management is intense. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. But if you want to have an effective program that's driven by volunteers, you've got to do it. So what's next? Where are we headed? How will we be sustainable after the, our funding ends? Uh, so we're in the process of getting things finalized, and we're continuing to work the evaluation plan. But how we will sustain this is we're taking that orientation and we're creating videos. And we're putting together a uh, leader's guide and uh, toolkit so that any community anywhere can take these materials and they can have everything they need to implement the program. So we're getting that is all coming together and we anticipate that will be available in August. So any community will be able to take all the mistakes that I made and not do them and really implement the intergenerational technology program. So in our role, we'll transition as we move into phase two of the project because we continue, we want to continue to evaluate and collect data. Um, there's when people study adults, particularly older people, and their technology use, the questions typically focus on, do you use it? They don't dig deeper. They don't explore how are adults using it. They don't ask the adults what is good, what is bad. It's just either you use or you don't use. And I think any of us who've used technology know it's a little bit more complex than we use or we don't use. So we want to really kind of build the evidence base about adult technology use, because right now it's um, very simple and needs to be expanded and explored. So our role will change. We won't be as actively involved in the day-to-day -day operation, the volunteer resource management. We will really um, help with that evaluation piece, provide that technical support, and continue to maintain the material so that communities can use them. I thought I took this slide out, but we'll just leave it on and I'll touch it briefly. The steps to implement the program, having that host site. You gotta have a host site. Libraries are pretty good sites that I've had some good success with. There's been some, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what we learn from the data that we're collecting here over the summer, because we have libraries on board now. And we were at senior centers. So it'll be interesting to see, um, is there a difference between the participation um, recruiting volunteers, so we have to have folks that are really active and engaged that are willing to do the work to implement this kind of program. Um, establishing a regular lesson schedule, you know, whether it's twice a month, once a month, every week, it's got to be regular. Um, that orientation, doing the orientation, the technology trainer orientation, marketing, and then program evaluation. So, Questions. I probably got like two minutes. Anybody have a question right now? Awesome. I really appreciate your time today. I've seen a few things that she's done with these students. Just give a couple examples of some of the examples that you do showing older adults how to navigate or how you show the young students some of the challenges of olders. Yes, sir. I, yeah, you're reminding me, I meant to add some photographs. So uh, I do that knowledge piece where I talk about aging. I explain what aging is. I explain how it's different from disability. But I do some experiential learning. So I have cataract simulators, goggles. 
Um, I have noise canceling headphones. I've got cotton gloves. And then I tape some fingers together and I make them use technology. And it's a really fine art of not saying, hey, this is what it's like to be old versus giving them that understanding that this is what it could be like, say, if you have arthritis or if we have low vision or if we can't hear as well and I'm trying to explain something to somebody. So we really do that experiential learning piece as part of the orientation to try to sensitize the young people to some of the experiences. You know, and I've heard the young people talk about how um, it made them more patient. You know, and that is critical because when we're trying to teach, it gets frustrating, you know, when we're trying to teach somebody, unless you're like me and you love teaching people to use technology, it gets frustrating. And if, especially if you have to keep saying it over and over again, why don't you just get it? Why don't you just click on the icon or the taskbar? And it's like, what's a taskbar? So it's just trying to provide that sensitivity to what um, someone may experience if they have a disability. Be thinking if you have any other questions at the end, because we will have a time for Q&A at the end of all three panelists. The next panelist we have is Michelle Madsen with Lutheran Social Services of South Dakota. They have the Better Together program that creates a positive connection and companionship to support age-friendly neighbors. So Michelle? Good afternoon, thanks for having me here. Um, it's gonna be a quick 15 minutes and I have a video at the end, so I will race through this first part. I just wanted to let everyone know that LSS is a statewide organization that has many, many services. What we often find is that people have heard of Lutheran Social Services, but then say, I didn't know you did that too. So we like to give everyone a good overview of everything that we do. Quickly, within Better Together, it falls in our mentoring services department. And if you are not familiar with that, that program operates in Lincoln and Minnehaha County, um, so the Sioux Falls regional area. And uh, we have about 1,200 volunteer mentors who go into the school and work with students in kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, and that program has been going for 16 years and is funded by the Sioux Empire United Way. Um, Two years ago, to kind of get started on Better Together, the United Way in our community does an assessment of business leaders and community leaders and um, on what needs are not being met in the community. And one thing that they found was things for older adults to do and um, they were lacking programming for people 65 and over. And um, LSS wasn't in the conversation because that's not uh, something that's in our core program area, but we do have that volunteer management experience. So when Lisey said <laughs> volunteer management is something um, a little trickier than it can be, uh, it's a great thing too. So, um, but with that in mind, that's why Better Together was housed at LSS. So the, um, we did a study with the Active Generations, which is the Senior Center and Meals on Wheels, um, and there was a need for senior programming and socialization became the number one need of what seniors needed. They were in their communities, they were um, even within their apartment communities were feeling isolated and disconnected and not really part of the community of Sioux Falls. So the central piece of Better Together is socializing. And what that means to us is the power of relationship and human interaction is so important and can't be, you can build all the houses, you can make everything accessible, but just leaving someone alone and what we're finding was a lot of people, their main, they watch television for many, many hours. They maybe went to a doctor's appointment once a week and that's all that they got out of their home. So just having that human interaction and human contact is something that was lacking. Um, so what we do is we find volunteers and we match them with a senior in our program who we call a neighbor. We found that people don't like being called senior citizens or older adults or anything like that. So our older adults in the program are called neighbors. 
um, and we match them with a volunteer based on interests, preferences, goals. Um, it's four hours a month of interaction, and um, our volunteers can choose when they do that. They can do whatever they decide together, so it's a really atomic um, program that it runs. Once they get started, they're really on their own. Um, and then we host regular uh, monthly activities, and bingo has become the most popular one that um, brings all of the matches together. So we've really started to um, establish new friendships and relationships between older adults in our community who are in this program as well. Uh, so our volunteers need to be over 18, and that four hours a month is important. Um, one thing that makes this program unique and very intergenerational is that volunteers can be an individual, a family, a couple. Um, so for example, I do it with my family. I have a eight-year-old eight and four-year-old, um, and it's been a great experience for them to get to know someone who's 80 years old in Sioux Falls because they don't have grandparents and great-grandparents around yeah, that live in town. So it's nice to be able to expose all generations and mixed generations together. Um, and that um, four hours a month can be set however you want. So very flexible volunteer opportunity. And then our neighbors are must be over 65 living independently. So not people who are in nursing homes. Um, we've had people go into specialized care as they've grown in their relationship and they can follow their volunteer there if it works for them. Um, and most importantly, need to be open to socializing. Um, the program does a lot of errand running and helping out, but we're not a home health agency. We're not... Uh, sorry, <laughs> a friend of mine. Um, we're not a home health agency. We're not um, someone who can run errands alone, give rides. We do a socialization and relationships are really the core of the program. Uh, a, one of the major parts of our program is that we do ongoing care and case management of the older adults in the program. So we don't get them started and leave them alone. Um, we do check-ins with them. Um, we meet with them in person and um, help the volunteer and provide referrals to other sources that they might need. So um, if we find, we um, had an older adult who essentially became homeless uh, because she got evacuated or evicted from her apartment. Uh, so helping her find housing resources, helping people get connected to feeding programs or whatever extra sources they might need is, um, and just having someone there to hold their hand and go with them to those opportunities is important. So um, a one thing, since we are grant funded, we do track a lot of outcomes. 100% uh, of our volunteers were prepared. We train the volunteers before they go so they know um, what to expect. Um, we have a great retention of 86% of the volunteers who started the program, ended the program a year later. We asked for a one-year commitment. Um, and then for the older adults, we found that 80% maintained a healthy level of companionship or improved. More often, they were um, being included in activities in the community. Um, and our biggest outcome and one that we're most proud of is that they were not feeling so isolated anymore. Most everyone felt like, I finally have a friend. I have someone I can call. I know someone who I can go to for help. Um, some of you might be wondering if you've heard of Senior Companions or um, some other programs, what the difference is. Um, Senior Companions is a peer-to-peer -peer program that operates statewide. Um, this program is different in that any age can volunteer to be part of it. Um, we also um, don't have our volunteers do housekeeping or home health activities. Um, they can help with that if they're comfortable, but it's not the main purpose. Um, we're different from senior centers because our volunteers go out and go into the homes of the older people. Um, churches often have a shut-in ministry or something similar where they have 
members of their congregation visit older adults who might not be able to get to church services or pastoral visits. Um, this program is open to anyone of any faith, so it's wide open to the community. Um, and then we're um, very long-term in our thinking. We ask for at least one year. Um, we've had matches that have been going two years, so they started right away. And um, the difference that it's made really starts to show after you've been meeting with a person for several months. And then lastly, um, I'm going to show a video because I think that really puts the whole program into good perspective. Um, but we have tons and tons of match stories. So there's one on the flyer that was in your folders. Um, and then I encourage you to look at Lutheran Social Services website and blog post to get more um, anecdotal stories of the impact this program has made. So let's hope the video works. My name is Mary Beth, and I'm a recent, well, I guess recent in my book. I've, I've been retired about two years, mostly retired. And I um, have time to be out there and do whatever I want to do, so I um, decided I wanted to do some volunteer work. I was reading the newspaper one morning, and I, there was an article advertising that there was a new program starting through Lutheran Social Services, and I clipped it out and put it somewhere <laughs> and uh, just uh, when I got ready to think I was going to have time to volunteer I called called it up and started from there. My name is Lois Schrader and um, I have lived quite a few centuries <laughs> I think anyway so I, I have been around the world a lot actually I'm 88 years old so um, I think I needed to be assisted rather than try to assist somebody else and uh, we found out about this program here at Sunnycrest about Lutheran Social Service having this Better Together and it sounded like something I would enjoy. To volunteer for the Better Together program the expectation is that you would devote four hours of time to the program and to um, being with your neighbor. It's flexible in that you can spend more time if you've got more available and more things that you want to accomplish with your friend that month? Well, it's something that I really needed because sometimes I, <laughs> I have no family other than Susan. And friends, you know, can be helpful if they're around, but they aren't all around in the summertime especially. And so I just thought that this would be something, one more that would be helpful to me. Ben Glor, the director of the program, um, organized a date for us. And so we all met at Lois's apartment and Basically sat and visited that day, got to know a little bit about each other and also about Ben. And then we just scheduled another time where we'd start out on our own. I've always been a people person. I always wanted to have friends. And some people don't seem to like, you know, they could care less just read a book, but I like the interaction. I guess I like to talk. Fun. I think we're kind of similar. We like to eat. <laughs> And so we've gone out to eat. We, I guess every time we get together, we, we got to eat. And she's introduced me to some really good pot pie out there. I feel like we've gotten to know each other quite a bit in uh, just a few months and kind of have a lot of the same interests. We have plans that we'd like to uh, go to the parks, do some sightseeing, maybe do some um, plays or activities down at the pavilion. The city has grown by leaps and bounds and uh, it's just fun to go around and look at the beautiful homes and the parks and so that's the kind of thing that we do. I think the best part of impact on me through the Better Together program is that I get to get out and socialize with someone and we're becoming better friends and more comfortable with each other. Uh, that's the main thing that, that I like about it, is that I can be available to assist and, and uh, make a new friend. A project like this for older people is wonderful. And I think Lutheran Social Service has really picked up the ball to run with it. And, and uh, I think it's going to grow. I hope it, it does. I'll, I'll be sure to say to my friends, you know, you don't have to pay somebody to come and sit when you can meet someone that, like this and have a good time and, and they enjoy it too. So. Thank both the United Way for 
helping to support it and losing social service for actually operating the, the whole program better together. I would like to thank the United Way for financing or contributing funds to the Better Together program. It's really been an opportunity for me to get out there and uh, volunteer for a, a great program and I know that it's a, a great uh, opportunity for the, the seniors that um, enroll on the program too to have a new friend and more socializing. Thank you United Way. And I think I think a lot of people people need people, right? Yeah. Like the song says. Yeah, that's it. Um, I think Lois says it best at the end that people need people. So um, when you're thinking about making your communities age friendly, um, or you're wanting more information about Better Together, please let me know. And please don't forget the power of relationships in that mix. Any questions? Are there? Are we going to go to oh, sure. Is it just in Sioux Falls, or is this a statewide program? Um, right now, it is only in Sioux Falls. In July 1st, we're expanding to Brookings too. So um, we're we're starting small. It's um, just in its second year right now. So um, we're looking at growing it in the coming years. I got a question for you. How do the people that are over the, whatever the age is, the, the elderly person. 65, yeah. How do they connect to this program? Do they, do they want in? Do they apply to come in? Do they, how do you find them and how do you get them in? Yeah, um, we've had uh, to work on that. So we've gone to churches. We've gone to um, senior living communities that are independent. Um, anywhere we can get the message out. We've done Meals on Wheels, inserts. Um, but they apply or are referred to the program. One of our best referral sources have been social workers in the, through DSS or through the hospital systems who see patients coming in that just seem lonely and need help. Okay, we'll move on to our third panelist, with his, which, who is Beth, Betsy Schuster from the Helpline. She's here to share regarding the Helpline Center's outreach support program to provide information and support through 211 Helpline to help isolated or homebound older people. Betsy? Well, thank you for having me today. Um, yeah, we um, are excited to do the outreach support program, which is using, it's a basically a telephone assurance program to connect with isolated and homebound adults. And the way that we um, utilize this through the 211 line and Aaron with United Way is here. So at 3.30, if you guys have an open calendar, we are um, immediately following this meeting, having another meeting to talk more about what 211 is in depth. But to understand how this program works, I just want to give you a short overview of what 211 is. And so the Helpline Center, we have been around since 1974. Our mission is making lives better by giving support, offering hope, and creating connections all day, every day. And we have three core service areas. One is 211. One is suicide crisis and support. So as I mentioned this morning, we do um, answer the suicide crisis line for the state of South Dakota. We are accredited by the AAS, which is the uh, American Association of Suicidology. And then we also have a volunteer connections program in three communities, Sioux Falls, Rapid City, and Brookings, where we help coordinate volunteers with nonprofit agencies. So they don't actually volunteer for the Helpline Center. We get them connected with their passion. And so the outreach support program is through 211. And some of our unique qualities of 2-on-1 is we serve anyone and everyone. We have no income limitations or age of the, um, requirements. We do referrals to nonprofit and government services with um, working to make the system more efficient and um, getting people to where they need to be faster. And so an image I like to show is really that bridge. And so if you have a bunch of questions in the community, but, and there are resources. How do you get over to the resources? Who do you call? Um, I remember one time I answered the phone because I'm trained to answer phones. And it was an elderly gentleman. And he was so frustrated because he could not read the phone book. He goes, I don't even know where to start. It's too small. It's yellow. 
the section I'm in, and he needed the phone number to the county treasurer's office. And we have that information. And in what was a simple phone call for me, solved a major issue in his life that day because he was so frustrated. And so that is our goal of 211. Um, we do a lot of our calls, yes, do have to deal with housing, um, food. I don't know. Where, what the hours of the food pantry are. We're short on, my, on utilities this month. My husband lo just lost a job. Absolutely, we answer those phone calls, but for all of us, we all have a question at some point. Um, is that a city department? Is that a county department? I'm getting married, where do I go for that? I'm having a child, where do I check my car seat? Um, all these questions, and two in one is that centralized location. And so when we thought about the outreach support program, I was, um, I've been in this role for almost two years in August, so I was hired um, for this role. I've been with the helpline in different roles for a while, and I remember um, on my first week, my, our president, Janet Kim's Lolly, she's like, so, um, you know that other duties as assigned? I was like, yeah. She goes, we're working on this new grant. I'm like, oh, great. Where was that in the, in, but I have fallen just completely passionate about this program. Um, and just what we're doing to help seniors get connected. Um, in this world of technology, as Lisi, it has, as Lisi's working, it has so many connectivity availability, but there's also, as Michelle said, that need for human connection, that need for relationships. And that's one thing what 211 does is in a crisis, yes, you probably could Google, but if you Google, I need food, what's gonna probably come up? Kessler's? or a grocery store, is the small church pantry gonna pop up, is another one. And so that need of, in the moment of loneliness, in that moment of just frustration, that human voice saying, you know what, it's gonna be okay. Well, let's see, where are the resources in your community to help you? And so with the outreach support program, I just, I'm um, gonna show you a quick video of two of our clients um, that really helps start the basis of the program before I jump into a little bit of the details on how it works. Joan, this is Helen. Yeah, hi. The outreach support program is for senior citizens who get more isolated, who get depressed because they're isolated. What I do is I call them and we visit. You know, you can dress warm and put a hat on, whatever you have to put on, and go. When I talk to these, these folks, I talk about anything and everything. We talk about their family, sometimes we talk about a little bit about my family, their pets. One of the things we always talk about is if they're feeling really lonely, if they're feeling really down. I go downstairs to have coffee, sometimes with them downstairs. Joan is a 90-year-old lady. Her son and daughter live in Florida, and her other daughter just passed away. I asked her how she'd been doing, and she said, well, she was really sad. And then we started talking about that and about how that's normal, but it's hard. It's hard losing a kid. I live here alone, and I asked them if there was somebody that could call me and check, see, you know, that I'm all right. And Helen got in touch with me, and then she called me and asked me how I'm doing and, you know, how my day is and so forth. Norbert is an 89-year-old gentleman. He's one of the first people that I got a referral from on Meals on Wheels. The only family he has is a grandson who's unavailable for the next two years, so he has really not many supports. And he's a veteran, and I talk to him at least twice a month. He calls me. He called a couple weeks ago to tell me his cats were doing really well. He really, he just, he just needs that connection. So he calls me just to visit. We talk about the weather. Every now and then, you know, I live here alone with my two cats, so but 211, you know, and we help, you know, help people out, you know. I'm gonna let you go now, okay? I think it okay. reduces loneliness okay, and isolation. Bye-bye. The Helpline Center's name says it. We're here to help. Norbert has um, originally, part of the program is um, weekly calls and then monthly calls, but always educating them 
questions don't always come up when Helen's working. And so to get them used to, they can always dial 211 some, and someone is there ready to help them. And at first, Norbert would only talk to Helen. And now he talks to everybody. Um, he, he's become, um, he calls probably a couple of times a week with valid questions on things he, that comes up. Um, he is, right now, he's struggling. Um, and I share this story. It's all confidential, but he signed a release to share his story. He knows he needs more assistance, but he doesn't want to leave his cats because that is really his lifeline, are his cats. One in the movie is very nice. The other one... God bless that cat. Luckily, the cat likes Norbert because that day I was like, I'm going to stand over here and that cat's going to be over there. But, um, and so he is a wonderful man. And then Joan, she passed away this winter. And one of her fears was um, she would pass away alone and no one would find her. And um, we had a call scheduled with her and um, part of the program is to get emergency contacts. And so when Joan didn't answer, we called her emergency contact who shared that she had passed away. But it was very... Um, humbling to know that we provided that support in that last couple months of her life and that she didn't die alone. She was, they got her moved into hospice. And so she had that support, but she was a firecracker. Um, when we were interviewing her for the, um, video, she grew up in like the Kentucky area. So she went to the Kentucky Derby a lot when she was, um, in the eighties and nineties, she said, and she's told us a story about, she goes, yeah, that mint julep you were supposed to drink. It tasted like toxic cleaner, but everybody was drinking it. So I had to. And one year she was ordering this drink and was talking, she was, I was talking to this nice African American man, uh, how this was just a toxic cleaner, but you have to drink it. And so she goes, then I went back to my group and they asked me, do you know who that was? And I was like, I don't know. He's nice looking. It was Michael Jordan. <laughs> so um, she, she had some famous in her, but um, she was a wonderful lady. But these are just two examples of what happens. And so the essence of the program um, is we get referrals. So originally the program, all the referrals were set up through the Meals on Wheels program. And so the Meals on Wheels uh, coordinator would offer this program um, if they were interested, because Meals on Wheels does a six month and a year checkup with their clients. Um, if they were interested, they would give us the name and phone number, and then Helen would make the call out to see if they were interested. And um, a, quite a few um, older adults will say no, because I think some of it is a generational thing is we're Midwestern. We don't need help. We're fine. Luckily, Helen is very um, persuasive. But the other, but I never saw no's as negatives because we still educate them on 211. And guess what? We're tracking it. They're calling us. So even if they said no, some of those individuals who have said no, they have called us to say, hey, now I got a question about this. They're not in the program, but they've now learned about the resource that they can call if they need a ride to a medical appointment or if they need to learn about senior food boxes in our community. And then, um, but if they say yes, we do an intake. And part of the program, which is really neat with the other services we provide, is the specialization in the crisis line, the suicide crisis line. So every single call, we assess for depression and loneliness through a PHQ-9. Um, well, a PHQ-2, first of all. And then if whatever they do that, Helen may go into a suicide risk assessment to make sure that their life is, um, that they're doing okay that day, or if we need to intervene. And so we've had to intervene a few times, just if they're really struggling and we need to get that extra help. But then we're also tracking loneliness. Um, we, she does a quick questionnaire at the beginning and then at the end of their calls. And right now um, it's showing we're reducing loneliness um, just by those weekly phone calls. And so the program, um, it's six weekly phone calls. Uh, and then the, the first year, we did six weekly phone calls, and then we did a three-month call and a six-month call. And some of the feedback we got back was they wanted more calls. And so now we do six weekly calls, an eight-week call, and then we do a four-month call, a five-month call, and a six-month call to sort of transition them. Um, and then always that education that they can call us at any time just because they're done with the calls doesn't mean they can't call us. And so um, overall, it's... Um, just a very inspiring, and we do right now because of the the grant. We we do an evaluation, and so we have a third party evaluator call the clients after the three month call to survey them about the program. And I just want to read some of the quotes. Um, they don't hold back. 
um, in what they think about the program. Um, but they're all a pot, um, positive. And so I just want to read some so you can hear it directly from the clients and how it's helping. Um, one said, my husband, this is in response to um, during your phone calls with the Helpline Center, did you and the caller talk about being sad or depressed or talk about things in your life that worry you or cause you stress? And a few of the comments is, my husband recently died, so it was just nice that she was so concerned. Sometimes I would be sad, and I wouldn't feel sad after we talked. Um, she asked me if I was depressed. I don't know if she could tell in my voice, but I was, and had been sick for quite some time, but, and, wasn't, and just wasn't feeling well. Um, I enjoy her taking the time to talk to me, and she is just great. I, I also know I can just contact 211 if I need someone to talk to. Sometimes I just feel alone. Sometimes you feel alone, so it is good to know that there are people out there willing to visit with you. Uh, and so that is one of the components is um, the is how what type of support do people really need? Some of them, like the telephone, we do offer a face to face intake with Helen uh, if they want to meet her one time. Half of them don't; they just want to do the telephone. We've referred to Better Together if they wanted that person. Um, another one, like for example, I couldn't get my grass cut. She found somebody to come and cut my grass. She kept checking and working to get my grass cut. Um, and then um, another, Helen sent me some stuff in the mail for me to take computer classes. And I called and got signed up for a computer class in the future. I hope she can teach, I hope you can teach an old dog a new trick or two, which Lisey would say absolutely yes. Um, and then also questions like, I was getting IRS calls on my phone, and she told me what resources to go to, and I found the right numbers and learned they were scams, and scammers trying to take my debit card money. So you think about, I think about, I'm very close with my grandpa. The office is close with him too now because I have him run errands to keep him busy. Um, some days I, my mother and I debate about putting him in this program um, just for a break, but you think... <laughs> Um, and then my, he, we, he has a flip phone and he, so he receives text messages, but he doesn't know how to respond yet. So my husband likes to send him text messages and the, all day my husband gets blank text messages back. And I'm like, you deserve that. Cause I know, I know my grandpa is sitting there all day trying to figure out how to respond, but he just is, he's got to the blank part, but no words yet. Um, so I tell my husband, I'm like, you had that coming, but uh, and so part of the program is not only assessing for loneliness and depression, but getting them connected to resources. So what do they need? So there's a few others where she encouraged me to go see a counselor and got me lined up. Because with the weekly calls, um, Helen will either sometimes make a three-way phone call. You know, if, if she feels like, okay, I'm going to give you that number, but you're, you're not going to call, or maybe she gave it in the next week they still hadn't called, then she'll do a three-way phone call. Because sort of when you think about that bridge, how can we hold their hand to get them across the bridge to the resource? And so connecting to different resources. Um, another one that um, when I read this quote, it just really um, like really struck home on what our whole goal was with the program. Uh, I just need to make sure I pull the right one. I don't know what I would have done without her. She is just my little angel. I just hated it when the day came that my time was up for the weekly calls. She was what got me back into reaching out to other people and talking. I had just isolated myself so much from the situation. Since talking to her, I have actually gone out of the house and gone to a luncheon. I just feel it was such a blessing. And so... 30% we ask the individuals, do they have family or friends helping them? 30% do not have anybody. Uh, the other 70% um, or so have a family member, a sibling, or a child, but they a lot of times family can't be there 100%. Or you think about how many times if you have a, an older parent or even a sibling, like you tell them what they need to be doing and they don't do it and they don't do it and then a neighbor tells them and you're like, Yes, I've been telling you that. And that's sometimes what this program is. They, this person might have had a, a, a friend or a son or daughter trying to encourage them to go to a luncheon, but it took an outside source to give them that boost. And so that is, I believe, um, the power of the outreach support program is getting them connected back into a community. And as Eric talked about, 
the, the wave of telemedicine, I think telephone assurance programs is a cost-effective way to get this expanded as well, whether it's just the encouragement to go to the senior center or if they are um, struggling with mental health issues or loneliness or depression, um, where's a counselor in town that you can go and talk to? Because um, we are not counselors. Our goal is to get them connected. So are there any questions about the program? I will just jump right now. Um, uh, right now, we are running it through um, 211. There is a brochure that I'll talk more about at the next meeting, but why your community needs 211. This is where two, uh, South, uh, 211 is in South Dakota. The majority of our clients are in Sioux Falls. We've just recently took a client from um, Brookings, and he got to us through the suicide crisis line. We referred him ourselves by talking to him. But so obviously our goal is to get this statewide, um, 2 on one statewide. I think as we move 2 on one statewide, you have more opportunities for partnerships like this. As Eric said, um, there's just a lot more of how do we use a single resource point because I feel a 50 doors of number, 50 options to call is just as overwhelming as zero places to call. So how do you break that overwhelmingness of who to call? And if you can create a central location for social services in your community or government, it's a great benefit to the, the infrastructure of everyone. So with that, um, I think I am out of time. Thank you. So interesting to hear about all this variety of programs. I would now like to introduce to you Maria Gonzalez Jackson, Director of Programs and Membership with the Grant Makers in Aging based in Arlington, Virginia. She had quite an experience getting here with the storms last night and got stuck in Minneapolis. So, but we're happy she finally made it here. And Grant Makers in Aging is an inclusive and responsive membership organization that is a national catalyst for philanthropy with a common dedication to improving the experience of aging. They have a wealth of information available on their website regarding this topic. We have some on display on the information table outside. We'd like to welcome Maria to South Dakota and ask her to share some comments about grant makers and aging. Good afternoon, and um, sorry to um, the folks here on the panel that I um, was late, um, but happy to be here on the ground um, in Aberdeen. Um, so, um, as Lori said, Grant Makers in Aging is a membership organization. Our members are foundations, corporate giving programs, and private philanthropists who support nonprofit organizations, such as the wonderful people on the panel today, um, who help older adults and their caregivers in their communities. And um, we are very happy to have partnered um, with these um, these organizations who are doing great work um, in different regions in South Dakota. And just to share with you the importance of, I think, um, age-friendly communities, which I believe Eric uh, spoke about earlier um, in the many hours I had to visit with native um, folks of Aberdeen in South Dakota um, in Minneapolis yesterday. Um, I, you know, it was about six hours of bonding. But, um, <laughs> and a couple more this, this morning. Um, but what I found uh, remarkable is um, really the sense of um, community um, and volunteerism with most of the older adults that I spoke with. And I think that's a great asset that South Dakota has and um, I think certainly builds upon the strength of the programs that you've heard about um, today. Um, but also to that video that said, um, you know, people just need people. I heard that over and over again um, yesterday. And just simple things, a telephone call, learning about new technology, but also finding ways to engage older adults. And I would say this, uh, the one gentleman that I spoke with, I mean, he had 40 years of experience um, and is just still very enthusiastic about the work that he did um, in engineer engineering and wants to share his wealth of information. And so I think that's also another important aspect to think about when we think about age-friendly communities is really highlighting the assets um, that all of us here in the audience, but um, that wisdom and expertise don't go away as you age. So I really think that's something to build upon. Um, and also the loneliness part. I spoke with one woman whose um, children actually live on the East Coast, um, and she was just coming back from a visit. Um, and her point was very telling um, that she said, and now I have to go back home um, to my empty house and wait for another year to go visit. 
And so for me, that's what I want to leave you with is, you know, this, the important um, work that everybody here is doing um, to really reach out to those um, whose only hope is to look forward to the, ne the next 12 months to have some connection and value. That's what she said. I feel valuable when I go back to my family. So I know that there are many ways that programs um, that are out there in the community can engage her and um, give her that sense of purpose and value. So thank you for um, your time and coming here today. So if, does anybody have any other questions for the panel? Question? One of the things that I often find when I'm dealing with older people in the communities that I work in and in my personal life is that there, there's an awful lot of pride there. There's an awful lot of independence there. And the programming that, that is coming out or the programming that you're doing, obviously meaningful, obviously well worth the time to do. But is there any insight or any ideas on how we can help these people? I, I, outside I was talking to Trevor, and get out of their own way. Because um, we're going to stay at home because we're too prideful because we don't want to use our walker. Or we're going to stay at home because we don't have any friends right now because they all died. Um, you know, how, how do you overcome that piece of, of or, or that problem, I guess? Because it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big thing, and it's, I think about all the farm widows. They're on the farm right now. They're at their own homes. They're very dependent on family. Their families are really good to them. But in terms of, of other types of socialization, you don't really get them out. So, and there are people like that in, in towns as well. How, how do we get them out of their own way or any insight there? So I want to make sure that I understand the question. And essentially is the adults don't want to participate in activities in the community? They're not participating out of a fear or an embarrassment. Um, I don't want to use my walker in public. Um, I can't go because I don't have anyone to go with. I don't know anybody that's there, or I'm not really that old. I don't want to be grouped in with all those old people. One of my actually, personal favorites. That is actually one of my favorite. You know, you have the little old lady who's 90, and I'm, she doesn't want to go to the senior center because that's where old people go. And, and they're not going to access, they're not going to look out and say, Lutheran Social Services isn't somewhere I'm going to access. That's, for them, that's not a thing. That's, a, that's social services, that's social work, that's caretaking. That's not what they're looking for. That, that for them, that's not somewhere a point to outreach. They're not going to call someone on the telephone for help because they're, they're stoic enough that it doesn't matter how they feel that day or whatever. They're, they're, that's something that, that I don't know that you can overcome in, in that way. I love the idea of the technology class because, because it's something they can go do maybe on their own and what they're learning is something they got to learn personally anyway to be able to, to do. There's, there's so much there to unpack and we could probably have a couple hour conversation. There's a lot of like that ageism piece, there's uh, that internal, internalized ageism and we could go have a long conversation and I won't go there because we're specifically talking about frail adults with disabilities and them not wanting to engage outside of their home or not access services. I think Betsy really Well, I think, to um, I think part of it to your comment um, is with the outreach support program, we get a um, referral, so we're calling them. And it does uh, take uh, a, cu a couple times because I, I totally agree that sometimes when you're, this is what I do, this is what I do, but we have seen success with those weekly calls. Like we can start to break those barriers down to say, hey, how about this week? Let's talk about trying this or talking. And yes, it takes a long time, but I think there is potential of just giving them other options. Um, and a lot of resources, it's amazing. And even in a small town, how many 
you guys are highly connected individuals in your towns, but how many people are not connected? So something that you might think of automatically, not very many people may know about. Or And so those are some of the things I would encourage is, is do they know about it? Or like the Better Together program, it's amazing because you have someone to go with you. And so that's another great program. And once again, it's that referral piece, getting them to say yes. Um, and so that's why Helen um, is, fa- is persuasive of just not, per- but in a way of just saying, here's like, I'm not going to be nosy. I'm not going to do this, but this is what I have to offer. And through telephone, um, we can break down a lot of barriers because they don't know us. They don't see us. Um, they see us as a friendly voice. And that's some other comments that you hear is she didn't know all my personal problems, but so I could tell her anything I wanted to. And she wasn't going to pass judgment because she didn't know who did this or who did that. And so that's a benefit I see of two on one is a confidentiality of breaking those barriers down to get them to take the next step of what works best for them. And um, I want to speak to the senior center about not wanting to go to senior centers. Um, That's the challenge when we make something specific to one age group. Senior has a negative connotation. Um, Who wants to be associated with people who are sick or disabled? None of us. So when we have these community centers, making a concerted effort to make sure that they're intergenerational instead of having like the community center where you know young people go to the gym and they play sports and then you have the senior center where older people go play bingo or whatever make it the same building so you're not asking someone to go to the senior center when they don't feel like an old person they're going to the community center where everybody in the community comes together you know so that's one strategy and it takes some work but reducing that age segregation piece so it's not a you know time for you to go to the senior center you're getting kind of old it's just a natural part of life by having that space that's created for all generations for all ages sure Um, and then one thing that we learned quickly was not to say call this program someone who or allow it to be someone you're isolated you're lonely you need this so um, we've stopped using those words very quickly Um, and then we've also Uh, have a surplus of volunteers and we say this volunteer is ready for you so just some language simple things that you know they feel wanted and that they need to be part of that relationship when they have a family wanting to learn from them or someone who wants to get to know them too so they feel uh, an equal part in that relationship not that they're a client or being helped and and I've got too much to say, but I'll throw this quick. So one of the strategies that I teach my volunteers, especially when we're talking about customizing a device to kind of accommodate us if we have low vision or whatever, I encourage the volunteers to talk about how maybe they like the text bigger on their device, or maybe they're gonna, they like to call such and such. Instead of when we have this, you need to do this mentality, a lot of us shut down. We don't like being told what to do. But if we can reframe the discussion and talk about what we like to do, we might inspire someone else. Same for like advanced healthcare planning, developing a will. Going to our parents and telling our parents they need to make a will, probably not gonna go well. But if we go to our parents and we talk about our will and the plans that we've made, probably gonna go a little bit better, so. Time for another question. Scott has one here. Well, not to tell you how old I am, but I'd like to think Eric Rollin-Bale I've been dating. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. Happy to oblige. But uh, speaking of senior centers, I do have a success story I'd like to share. One of the communities up here in the Northeast, they kind of turned around that perception, and, and uh, the local manufacturer, obviously there's a lot of times workforce development shortages in, in manufacturing, and they've engaged their local senior center in this community, and they're they really truly put them to work on certain days of the week. They, they bag up nuts and bolts and washers and instructions and, and package them and do work that they're capable and it truly gives them a sense of value and purpose and, and you have Mavis yelling at Herman, you better be here on time, we got work to do. And, you know, but they come together as a group and they're probably the most well-funded senior center that they meet and they have meet meetings and minutes and is that in South Dakota? Yes, that's fantastic. Yes. Sounds like the village model where everybody has a yes. role. So that's all. And that's fantastic. And leadership evolves and 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 they grant out money back to community projects and it's really quite successful. And 
and it's replicable. Other communities could do that too. And it's inclusive. You know, engaging the folks we're trying to serve in the development is critical. There's a wealth of knowledge with this group of panelists here, and I know they'd all be happy to share their business cards or you share your card with them to make that connection so that they can be a resource to help you as you navigate through some of these complexities in your communities. We have in the packet this age-friendly community resources, just a snapshot of some of the information that's available on the website. Here's another, what an infogram, if pictures mean more to you, just some ideas to think about regarding the topic. Um, age-friendly communities I've discovered is a very diverse topic and as the age-friendly flower that we connected on represents a very, the variety of aspects that this topic actually entails. With all the information on the internet available at SDSU's iGrow website, AARP, Grant Makers and Aging website, there's also in your packet the economic benefits of age-friendly communities that was Grant Makers and Aging put together. And to conclude, we'd like to thank the South Dakota Community Foundation and Grant Makers and Aging for being here today and helping us make this workshop and information gathering available to all the people in the room. Without any further ado, thank you all for coming and being a part of this information gathering about Grant Makers and Aging. Thank you.